It's really a great honor and a great privilege for me to uh, introduce our two guests tonight, uh, Marie Condé and Jeanne Cat, on the occasion of the publication, of the English translation of Marie Condé's uh, novel, Victoire, My Mother's Mother, translated by uh, Richard Wilcox. I want to first um, thank and acknowledge our co-sponsors. Uh, first of all, uh, Shani Pierre and the Maison Française, who are once again making the Maison really one of the intellectual centers of, of the university. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Professor Roman de Duf and the Institute for African Studies, um, the Institute for Research on Women and Gender for their support, and uh, Francis Negron Montaner and the Center for the Study of Ethn Ethnicity and Race, who um, uh, helped make this event possible. And I also want to mention that the, the Center for the Study of Ethnicity and Race is now forming a Caribbean faculty working group. And so uh, if you're interested in this group, please uh, contact CSER, the Center for the Study of Ethnicity and Race. And also my thanks uh, to Richard Philcox for helping with this event together. Richard. Um, I'm delighted to introduce Professor Marie Condé, which is Professor Emerita in the Department of French at Columbia, where she began teaching in 1995. At Columbia, she founded and chaired the Center for French and Francophone Studies, which really helped develop a truly interdisciplinary interest in the French-speaking world among faculty and students. She is a preeminent Caribbean writer and truly one of the most engaging and important novelists writing today. Uh, her, her writings ask questions about the history of Guadeloupe, about the history of colonialism and slavery, about politics, about the African diaspora, and about the possibilities uh, that fiction open up for us. She's the author of numerous works translated into dozens of languages, and among her most well-known works I'll just cite a few. Eri uh, Macono, I, Tituva, Black Witch of Salem, Crossing the Mangrove, Le Coeur à Rire et à Pleurer, which is a memoir, and her latest book, Vic Victoire, My Mother's Mother. Her books have become the center of numerous scholarly studies. They have touched a wide readership. They have changed the way we read fiction and they are regularly taught on college campuses, including Columbia, where her works are studied uh, every semester. Uh, Edric Danticat is one of the most powerful young voices in American fiction today. She's a Haitian-American writer and the author of num numerous works, including Breath, Eyes, Memory, her first novel, Krik Clapper, Krik Clack, a collection of stories about Haiti uh, during the Duvalier uh, regime. The Dew Breaker and Brother I'm Dying, which came out in 2008 and won the National Book Critics Circle Award for Autobiography. And of course, Edric Danticat is a graduate of Warner College. Uh, and so I'm absolutely delighted to welcome both of you back to Columbia and back to the Maison Française tonight. Uh, the format um, for tonight's event um, will be a conversation between Edric Danticat and Marie Condé. Uh, and then there'll be, uh, the floor will be open for questions after, or at some point in the conversation. Um, which will be passages from, from the book. Uh, I also want to mention that the uh, books of both authors are on sale, continue to be on sale, um, outside, right outside uh, the East Gallery. Um, and so after the conversation, the author should be there to sign their, their books. And I also want to invite everyone to a reception upstairs um, at 8 o'clock. Uh, and I've, I've just been informed that there's another reception that will be happening right outside. That's the wrong reception. Don't <laughs> go up, upstairs. <laughs> so um, thank you so very much. I'm going to read the first four pages. It's the prologue to Victoire, my mother's mother, so that we can put it into context and set the tone of the book. 
and uh, begin the conversation between education and maths. Can everybody hear me without the mic? Okay. Yeah, we can hear you. Girl. <clears throat> she died long before I was born, a few years after my parents were married. All I have of her is a sepia-colored photo signed by Caton, the photographer in vogue at the time. Set on top of the piano where I practiced my scales, the photo depicted a woman wearing a dress with a wide lace collar that gave her the look of a schoolgirl, an impression heightened by her slight figure. On her tiny feet were a pair of patent leather button shoes like those of a first communicant. A gold chain necklace was clasped around her delicate neck. How old could she be? Was she pretty? I couldn't say. However, once she had captured your attention, you couldn't take your eyes off her. The sight of her never failed to make me feel uneasy. My mother's mother had that Australian whiteness for the color of her skin. Her soft colored eyes like Hambo's set deep in their sockets were reduced to two Asian slits. She was staring at the lens without the shadow of a smile and without any attempt to appear gracious. Her head tie knotted with two points signified an inferior station. Kitty mouchoir pour chapeau, swap the head tie for a hat, was the expression of the time that paid homage to a woman's social ascension. In short, she jarred with my world of women in, in Italian straw bonnets and men necktied in three-piece linen suits, all of them a very black shade of black. She appeared to me doubly strange. One day, I must have been seven or eight, I couldn't keep it bottled up any longer. Mama, what was my grandmama's name? Victoire, Elodie, Kidal. The name filled me with admiration, especially as I lamented the sound of my own. I particularly loathed my first name, which I considered insipid. Marie's little Mary. Her name resounded with a deep ring of a bronze metal, resonant. What did she do in life, I persisted. I can remember dusk was falling, and the sun was already an orange color in the sky that was veering to gray. We were in my mother's bedroom, me sprawled on her bed, although it was strictly forbidden. She sitting next to the wide open window to take advantage of the last rays of sunlight. With her finger elegantly encased in a silver thimble, she was pushing a needle as she done. She hired out her services, she blurted. You mean she was a, a servant? I said, mortified in disbelief. My mother turned to face me. Yes, she was a cook. A cook, I exclaimed. I couldn't believe it. My mother, the daughter of a cook, my mother, who had no palate and who was notoriously incapable of boiling an egg, <laughs> During our stays in Paris, we would make do on weekdays, scraping out cans of food, and on Sundays, we would scour the neighboring restaurants. A peerless cook, my mother emphasized, she had the touch of a genuine chef. Delighted, I hastened to add, me too, I'd like to be a cook. Going by my mother's expression, I knew I was on the wrong track. She wasn't bringing me up to be a cook, not even a chef. I quickly changed the subject and made a diversion. And she didn't teach you anything, not even one recipe. She continued without answering the question. She first worked in Grand Bourg for the Jovial, some relatives of ours. That ended badly, very badly. Then, then she migrated to La Pointe and hired out her services to the Wildbergs, a family of white Creoles, right up until she died. That's where I grew up, she added. I went from amazement to stupefaction. Reality was stranger than fiction. To think that this woman, my mother, who was a black militant before her time, had grown up with a family of white Creoles. How could this be? I tried to clarify matters. She never got married then. Who was her father? Such a conversation might surprise some people. At the time, to have a father to be recognized by him, to share his daily existence, or quite simply bear his name, was the prerogative of a rare privilege. It was no shock to me that my parents, like so many others, emerged out of a kind of fog. My, my father, an unrepentant chatterbox, claimed that his, his father had gone to dig for gold in Paramaribo, Dutch Guyana, abandoning his mother, who was breastfeeding her baby on the Mornakai. 
Other times he claimed his father was a merchant seaman shipwrecked off the coast of Sumatra. Where did the truth lie? I think he recreated it at will, taking pleasure in enunciating the syllables that made him dream, Paramaribo, Sumatra. Thanks to him, from a very early age, I understood that you forge an identity. My mother forwarded her darling. I don't want to talk about all that just now. It's too painful. Another time, perhaps, go and do your homework. Petrified, I left the room. Obviously, there never was another time. We <coughs> never resumed that conversation. My mother never re revealed to me who her father was or the circumstances of her birth. Yet, I could never get that conversation out of my head. It was probably then that I made the resolution to research the life of Victoire Hidalgo. But my own life has been so chaotic. I let the years go by. Sometimes I would wake up at night and see her sitting in a corner of the room like a reproach, so different from what I have become. What are you doing running around from Segu to Japan to South Africa? What's the point of all these travels? Can't you realize that the only journey that counts is discovering your inner self? That's the only thing that matters. What are you waiting for to take an interest in me? She seemed to be telling me. Now I have the time to follow her footsteps. Her picture is somewhat blurred and difficult to identify. For some, she was lovely. For others, pale and ugly. Yet others saw her as a downtrodden creature, illiterate and of no interest and some as a real Machiavelli in a petticoat. When describing her, my mother would use those worn-out clichés of the Antilles that no longer mean anything. She could neither read nor write, yet she was the mainstay of the family, a formidable woman. Certainly not. Certainly not the mainstay of the family. However, with her meager resources, she managed to force open the doors of the burgeoning black bourgeoisie for her daughter. But was it really worth it in the end? That is the real question I ask myself. That ample faculty my mother had for suffering and torturing herself, which she left to all of us, victoire was the cause. Thinking she was acting for the best, she condemned my mother to live her childhood in solitude and ostracism, which had a considerable influence, not only on her character and behavior, but also on that of her descendants. I often wonder what would have been my relation to myself, my vision of my island, the Antilles, and the world in general, what my writing that expresses all this would have been if I had been cradled in the lap of a buxom, jovial grandmother full of traditional tales. Tim, Tim, Boisek, is the audience asleep? No, the audience is not asleep. A grandmother, former dancing star of the Woka and Mazurka, whispering in my ear sweet myths of the past. Such as it is, here is the portrait I have managed to trace whose impartiality or even exactitude I cannot fully guarantee. An attempted translation of Aizu Tuba and, um, and I have been since then a great, great reader and fan. And this book was um, really wonderful to, to, to read uh, because it's, um, it gives us another opportunity, I guess, to delve further into, into your life. But it made me um, um, wonder why you chose to call it a novel as uh, in that a personal history or a family history. Uh, you know, I wanted to call it in French uh, a récit. I don't know how you say uh, a tale. But uh, the publisher, you know, the publisher is the one very important. She told me that uh, a book called a Tale, a récit, will not sell. That you have to write on the cover a novel. And people will buy it, people will prefer that. So I, I obey, and I got <laughs> to read a novel. But my choice was a recipe. <laughs> and hopefully you'll be talking more than I was. <laughs> um, so it, 
Then that brings the, the, the question to how how much of it is um, is true? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it seems to me you know that at least in a book you never know what is true and what is the invented. Whatever book you write, you invent as much as you uh, remember. The things that take in the book. I was talking about uh, my grandmother who died long before I was born. About my mother who died when I was an adolescent. About two people that really I never, I didn't know perfectly well. One of them not at all. So it seems to me, of course, there is a basis of uh, truth, true facts. I interviewed so many people, I read so many historical books and so on, but I mean, I met him quite a lot. And if you are careful, look at the first page of the book, and I have, I, I see what does it matter, whether I imagine or whether I tell the truth. The only thing is the impact on the reader, how you receive the book, I don't think that truth is a real important thing for a novel. Uh, imagination, truth, all that is mixed up, and I could not tell what is true, what is not. And I hope you don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> we, we don't mind. But what, the, what was the research process like? I, I, halfway through the book, you talk about uh, running into a student who sends you some information and it, it seemed as though you were, people knew that you were in the process of writing this and um, so you, how long had you been interviewing and how? Uh, it seemed to me that uh, it took me years, or oh, let's say 10 years. I started, you know, informally uh, as my mother was dead. And one, I was trying to remember what she was telling me. Because uh, as a girl of uh, 13, 14, you don't really pay attention to what your mother tell you, takes you. You listen, but uh, most of the time, she's boring. <laughs> <laughs> she comments that you should do that and that. And so you are you don't uh, listen to her. So uh, it is only when she was dead that I felt really sorry. That really I didn't pay attention to her when she was alive. And for you to understand, she was a very difficult person, bizarre. <laughs> On one hand, she could be very tender, very loving, very affectionate. On the other hand, she could really slap me right in the face. And uh, there were a lot of stories circulating about her in Pretapil. Uh, she beat the uh, policeman with the umbrella. She was <laughs> nasty. She was uh, clear. She was violent. So she was a kind of enigma. So I had to understand exactly who she was. So uh, the first uh, interview that I asked to be do, tell me about Jane Kidal. And every other time, the stories about her were negative, bitter. Uh, and only once I met a girl who had been her a student or, uh, at school. And the girl told me, your mother was the most delightful person. I was so happy because it was the first time I remember. So, uh, you know, interviewing a person about her was the first stage. And then I interviewed people about the group at that time uh, when she was a child. And then, to understand my mother, I had to discover the kind of relationship she had with her her own mother, my grandmother. So it was the third stage, stage and it was another younger 
fine research. I'm trying to put that in, in order, but you know, when you write, uh, you are not uh, looking for order. Things have to come in chaos, and you organize afterwards. But really, there were three stages. Uh, my mother, uh, Guadeloupe, what it was, and after Victor, who she was. Um, the the mother daughter relationship is very it's very interesting it's very volatile sometimes between Jean and Victor and uh, and you can when Richard was reading the section of um, Victor you could see even though she's not the the books of grandmother who tells the tales on the lap but she comes across as a softer more loving figure even in this reoccurrence but also in the few recollections of people who had, who had known her. And the, complication of, the complications of each woman, how much was that you, part of your legacy growing up? Uh, how much was that something that you, be, before the research, is that something that people tried to project on you? Yeah. Sort of the daughter and granddaughters of the, the daughter of these very complicated women. As I get a uh, just now, I never could understand my mother. So uh, there was one bit of very bad thing, sentence, that he used to tell me. Because as a child, I was very fond of going into the kitchen. The maid tell, enfin, taught me how to bake a cake, how to prepare a loser, and so on. And my mother, whenever I was coming out of the kitchen, would tell me only stupid women go enjoy cooking. <laughs> so I was really, really mortified. I was even ashamed to like cooking. And it took me a year. I, I could not understand that the sentence. It took me a, a lot of time, many years, to see that in fact, my mother was reacting to her own mother who wanted to cook and she was trying to be nasty, not to me as a child, but to her own mother because she was uh, very fond of her mother. It seemed to me she adored her mother, but at the same time, as uh, you heard uh, Richard telling you, the mother could never speak French, always Creole, totally illiterate. A woman straight from the country, uh, a shame when you were taking the, the mother into the living room of some educated person, she had all the time to be remain silent because whenever she opened her mouth, it was a complete, total disaster. So, I mean, my mother was fond of her mother, extremely fond of her. But at the same time, she was deeply ashamed of her. And so, when my uh, grandmother died, you know, when somebody is dead, you have all sorts of feelings of remorse of memories. She was convinced that she had been a very bad daughter. And so it seemed to me, one of the reasons why she was violent, cooling, nasty with everybody, was that remorse deep down in her mind, in her heart, that she was also then covering. So uh, the clue of uh, herself was to <coughs> know, to understand the relationship with her mother. Once it was uh, clear, enfin, clear, more or less clear, her image became uh, more complete. I couldn't understand her image. Uh, there's a, a, a story they tell in Haiti about shame, about sort of this um, child who graduates from medical school and his mother or her mother, depending on who's telling it, was a, a, a charcoal seller. Mm -hmm. And then he or she takes uh, another woman to the graduation because they're, they're ashamed of their mother. And I kept thinking about that story. I think there's ways it, that it's, um, there's that shame that sort of this upwardly mobile person has. 
and then um, which but a bit of humor comes out of it because every time there's in the book every time someone is introduced to the mother the mother said so then she becomes in a which is great translation mrs god willing madame <laughs> sidirly um, there is a in the, the the way the story is told there's um it seems um elements of oral narration because sometimes you address the, the reader directly. Sometimes you'll say, "We'll get back." You know, they'll say, "We'll get back to, to this later." It's a sense of, um, and you get a sense as you're going along, along that you are telling the story to someone. Did you have someone in mind, a particular uh, yeah. person in mind? Maxim. I was, uh, in fact, uh, writing about my mother and her mother was writing about myself. You know, uh, when you lose your mother at a young age, and my mother was an only child, you have, uh, in fact, no, no family, no female character to identify uh, to. So I mean, you don't exactly know who you are. I spent a lot of years uh, when I was uh, young in Africa, uh, everywhere, trying to understand who is Marie Scondé? Who is she really? What people say she is? Is she really something, somebody different? Who is she? And it seemed to me that writing that book was a way of uh, uh, finding out who I am. Now I know, more or less and uh, who my mother was. And when I knew who my mother and my grandmother were, I could uh, understand myself. And I know now what kind of person I am. Have, uh, have people in your family read, read it? And they hated it. that. <laughs> <laughs> Especially uh, my sister uh, wanted to believe. She wants to believe that the victoire is the devoir of a noble Frenchman. <laughs> when I really am sure, uh, because of my research, she was the daughter of a militia, of a soldier. And a soldier who had on her as soon as, she, even before she was born, when her mother was pregnant. So my, my sister was furious that uh, her Gilanogy was in fact uh, destroyed by me. And in fact, they never liked uh, the image uh, of my mother that I was giving. They wanted a kind of ideal mother, so perfect, so good, uh, in complete contradiction with what everybody was telling about her. But never mind, they wanted her. So in fact, they hated the wood that me. What can you do? What can you do? I, they, they probably, um, one of the things I, I thought it was interesting that you went deeply into both Victoire, the grandmother's sexual life, and, and Jeanne's too. It's sort of uh, this, and at some point they were almost, they seemed almost in competition for the same lover, and, and it, it probably didn't help that the, the whole, the sexual yeah, element. Yeah, but that is total imagination because I, <laughs> I can't remember that with my mother, even once we talked about sexuality. She never told me anything about that, about the sex, about love. No, but my brother, one of my brothers, keeps kept telling me. Uh, she married a man who was 20 years older than her because she was interested only in money, prestige, and social uh, security. <laughs> so I mean, I have a kind of uh, ambiguous image of her death. Although she never told me anything about sex, I was trying to see her as a kind of uh, repressed person. So, but I confess all that machination 
And my grandmother, I know, I know she was a mistress of a white uh, planter who showed very common in the days. And because of that, it seems to me she was more liberated on one hand and following a kind of a pattern of a submission to the white male. I'm so French, huh? <laughs> 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 so, it, so it seems to me that uh, if you ask me about the uh, sexuality, I have to say that I am all that is totally invented. That's the novel part. Yeah. <laughs> Um, speaking of which, then we ask another source. Which one should I read? There are seats over here. You can go around that way. January 15, 1891 was a date to remember. First of all, Boniface Wahlberg Jr., born nine months after Jeanne, was christened in the Cathedral of St. Pierre and St. Paul in front of an assembly of white Creoles. Second, on the occasion of this christening, Victoire's talent as a cook was revealed to one and all. Why then? Probably because Anne-Marie had had enough of the hostility that surrounded her only friend, yet spared her. She wanted to thumb her nose at the narrow-mindedness and arrogance of polite society. I'll make them drool, she was heard to say. Among the papers my mother kept was issue 51 of Les Cours where right in the middle of a laudatory article appears the menu for this christening banquet, lyrically composed like a poem and probably sent to the newspaper by Anne-Marie. The occasion was held at the Valbergs, a Roman feast, the work of a genuine amphitryon. Judge for yourselves. Black pudding stuffed with crayfish. Whelks on a bed of wild spinach and dasheen leaves. Lobster with green mangoes. Pork caramelized with aged rum and ginger. Rabbit fricassee with bourbon oranges. Chayotte gratin, golden apple gratin, green banana gratin, purslane salad, three sorbets, coconut, passion fruit, and lime, creole gâteau fouetté. What bold imagination, what creativity presided over the elaboration of these delights. Dear reader, isn't your mouth already watering? <laughs> In those days, servants were passed around and exchanged like coins. They were borrowed and returned and never asked for their opinion or paid the slightest wage. From that day on, Anne-Marie was bombarded with requests on visiting cards from the most eminent families. Could she loan Victoire for a christening, a birthday, or a wedding? Each time, she had great pleasure replying in the negative. Since it is a well-known fact that desire is aroused if it is not reciprocated, Victoire's reputation increased with every refusal. Those who had disparaged her the most, in a total about-face, coveted her and dreamed of appropriating her for themselves. Victoire did not appreciate the fuss made of her person. She reluctantly confided in Anne-Marie the secret of her culinary compositions, so that the latter could name them and have them printed. As with a writer whose editor decides the title, cover, and illustrations of a book, it was partly like being dispossessed of her creation. She would have preferred to keep it secret. For her, cooking in no way implied wreaking vengeance on a society that had never made room for her. More than music, where she never excelled at playing the guitar or the flute, it was her way of expressing herself, which was constantly repressed, prisoner of her illiteracy, her illegitimacy, her gender, and her station as a servant. When she invented seasonings or blended flavors, her personality was set free and blossomed. Cooking was her pale about rum, her ganja, her crack, her ecstasy. She dominated the world. For a time, she became God, once again, like a writer. <laughs> <laughs>
That's the wishful thinking. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, Victor, Victor as cook is uh, is such a an important part of the of this book. Like one of one of the most um, stunning examples uh, for me was that sort of um, not to give too much away, but that supper, the final the oh, supper. Yeah. Yes, ga gathering you know this this incredible meal of been having everyone around her and. Um, and I was always intrigued these these um, comparisons that you make to with cooking and writing and the torture of you know her not being able to cook when she uh, when she wanted to and it was sort of when she was most in pain when she wasn't cooking in the way that a writer would be when um, he or she is not writing and you state out or uh, uh, pretty clearly throughout the book that you are trying to make these connections between cooking and and writing. Is that a way to was that a way to move closer to, to, to better understand your subject, or did you or, or do you do you are you equating uh, the same way with Alice Walker and that essay in Search of Our Mother's Gardens, where she talks about people who are who cannot be women and you know who came before who cannot be artists, but express it this this other way. Did you see her as a kind of artist before? Yeah, you know. Uh, it is a bit uh, complicated to, to answer because normally in a, in a Guadeloupe at least, uh, cooking means repeating something a traditional dish. Uh, you are a good cook if you know how to cook uh, a matete, a colombo, or something like this. That is to say, you don't invent. You repeat something which is traditional. There is no creativity about cooking. It's only repeating. And uh, what uh, surprised me when I read my mother's uh, notebook, Victoire, in fact, invented the dish that she was preparing. The most, it is the most surprising when you know that she never traveled. You, when you travel, when you go to Japan, Indonesia, Mexico, and when you eat something, you decide, I'm going to do the same when I get back home. But she never left Guadeloupe. So all the ideas were coming from her mind, from her own uh, creativity. So for me, I started uh, seeing her as a kind of uh, a genius. A genius, she could not write, she could not uh, speak uh, French, but she could prepare a uh, food to entertain not only herself but the whole family. And it seemed to me that I could, uh, without exaggeration, compare that to the work of a writer uh, trying to. Uh, seduce people whose words that uh, the writer puts together. It is not only a story that you are telling uh, the reader, but you are giving them a piece of music to listen to, uh, to hear. So it seems to me the creativity of a writer can, uh, could be compared to the creativity of Victoire. If my mother uh, who was very dedicated, but who could not do anything, could not cook, could not sew. I never do. S I never see her doing something, inventing something. My real, comment uh, uh, dire The real person I inherited really from my grandmother because the cook is the same in her case as a writer. We are doing the same type of uh, effort and job. We are trying to. And she, she uses in Victoire her, her food as a means of communication. For example, when the daughter is pregnant, they're not really speaking, but she's stuffing her with food that she, the, other, you know, the daughter doesn't quite want to eat, but it's their way of it's 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 a way of expressing of expressing love without <coughs> without communicating you know, at the same at the same time. 
uh, and uh, when when she was forced, she was forced to cook for her daughter and her husband when she were trying to to have a better position, social position, and she she was unhappy. And uh, what she did was what she cooked was very bad because you can't cook, you can't write if you are not uh, in peace with yourself. If somewhere you are not, I won't say happy, you are never happy. <laughs> but I mean, if you are more or less satisfied with the uh, life around you. So, Victoire, uh, it depends on the section of your life. For example, the last supper. Can you read the last supper, Mr. Tula? Can I just read it? No, the last one. No, the last one. No. Bon, alors. Bon. Okay. Then he gets fun. Bon, alors. Let us go back to the question. Uh, for me, I believe the writer is a and cook are doing the same type of uh, experiment. One is the uh, words, the other one is the uh, fish, meat, and so on. So, do you the I'm going to call this meal the Last Supper. It could be the subject of a painting with Victoire in the center, surrounded by the people she had cherished throughout her life. But on that particular day, she did not simply reunite those who were dear to her before death carried her off. It was her way of writing her last will and testament. One day, she hoped, color would no longer be an evil spell. One day, Guadeloupe would no longer be tortured by questions of class. The white Creoles would learn to be humble and tolerant. There would no longer be the need to set a club of grand nègres against them. Both would get along freely, intermingle, and who knows, love each other. The days preceding the lunch, Victoire went into action. She set off back to the market. Slipping on again her old habits, she bargained hard the price of shellfish and fowl. She did not let herself be fooled about how fresh the fish was or how tender the meat. No need to say that on this occasion, she outdid herself. Up at four in the morning, she spent the whole of Saturday and most of Sunday morning in the kitchen, since she wanted this meal to remain a lasting memory on the palate and in the heart. My mother wrote out the menu of this memorable day on one of her exercise books that she carefully kept, scribbled with bits of her diary, memos, <coughs> class timetables, and her children's height and weight. Conch and freshwater fingerling pie. Sea urchin chauffois, fatty chicken caramelized in juniper, white rice, rindless pork with bread nuts, yam puree, lettuce salad, coconut flan, assortment of sorbet, plus champagne, obvious fine wines, and his excellent courvoisie cognac. And it could be said, according to one of his favorite sayings, on that day, Lucullus dined with Lucullus. Do you cook? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. Ask Roger. Ask Kanyama. Yes, I cook. I do only that. Ask Ramzi. Oh, yeah, I guess the fact that they're all here means that <laughs> they came because of that. Um, I, I uh, would be remiss if I didn't uh, point this part out because that it's one of the things that that I thought, whoa, um, I'm in there. Um, the Haiti connection in the in the book. Um, it was it was so wonderful to see kind of that Haiti and. You know where it's sort of like the doc, the best of the doctors, and the and uh, people going going to Haiti to to hunt um, for Guadeloupe, and they saw it, you know, as something as something special. 
um, is, is, could you tell me a little bit about Yeah, because uh, you know, uh, we are talking about a lot about what I invented, secular life and so on. Yeah, but there is a new part of that book, which is research, historical research. All my friends uh, who are uh, specialists in history told me uh, about Guadeloupe uh, in those days, Martin in those days, and the way people live, people uh, went about educating themselves, curing themselves, and so on. And so at the time, uh, I was told by a friend, uh, Pierre Saint-Ton, who is a Yankee Zorian in Guadeloupe, that in fact, France was so racist that it was very difficult for black person, either men or women, especially men, to go and apply uh, for university. He was all the time uh, rejected. So I mean, the, the way, the <coughs> solution for the black people from Guadeloupe and Martini was to go to Haiti. Now we see Haiti as a kind of uh, victim of so many things. Don't forget, at the time, Haiti was la perle des Antilles. It was a powerful, very bright, very important place. So uh, people went there to study, to become doctors, to become lawyers. And really, it was a place very important for all of us. Uh, the reason uh, I'm thinking now of the book that uh, Martin Monroe is uh, writing. The reason why all of us from Guadeloupe and Martin, we have that kind of uh, fond, extinct fond relationship with Haiti, is it because for us, Haiti had a particular role to play in the region. It is not at all as people like to say now, journalists like to say, the poorest country of the Western Hemisphere, not at all. For us, it is a bright star with a lot of problems, unfortunately. But I mean, we had a special and very fond relationship to uh, Haiti. So, of course, I have to find a way of talking about Haiti in the novel. Mm -hmm. It did a, it did a great deal for my <laughs> Yeah, it, um, I saying, it did a great deal for myself, <laughs> especially now. But um, is, the, <laughs> is, the, is the Papa dark? Is that is that the palier? <laughs> the, when a, someone is uh, is seen uh, by by a doctor in Papa dark? No, uh, that is not the sign of a writer. I like to uh, uh, joke. I'm <laughs> 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 one of the good doctors in the days is Scott Papada. But he's, a, he's an OBGYN. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the other sort of, I, I felt sort of this lingering ghost over, and I, 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 I sort of, there was a, a very brief mention, but I fell madly in love with Jean. Ah, oh, my brother. Your brother, oh. yes. <laughs> <laughs> I know, and I have a husband. So <laughs> but um, part of it's, I think it's, it seems so galant. He's a, he's a, he's a young brother who he dies in a concentration camp, yeah. captured by the Germans. It's, um, and it seemed, and, and we also were introduced to him through a photograph that we mm. know with, with Victoire. Is that, is there, yeah, Your exploration. No, no, because you know, I I never knew him. He died uh, before I was born. But you never knew. Him. Or maybe he died in France when I was a baby. But yeah. So uh, one day, uh, my mother told me, as it, she told me about Victoire, that my brother Jean died in a concentration camp, and there is a man. Uh, in uh, Guadeloupe, Martinique, exactly, called Serge Billy, who is uh, doing a lot of research on the black people, on the people who died 
in concentration camp. So I asked him if he could research Jean Boucolon, my brother, uh, dead, dead in a concentration camp. But uh, he didn't do anything. So I don't know more about him. I know that he was very handsome, very attractive, and that he died. Uh, that's all. It's a very, it's a, it's mentioned in passing your book, but it's very novelistic at the same time. Yeah. You know, just the, the presentation. Um, from what uh, Richard read too, there's a, it's Victoire, when she's doing her, doing the Last Supper, hopes that um, one day color would no longer be an evil spell, one day Guadeloupe would no longer be tortured by questions of uh, class. How, how much closer have we gotten to Victoire's I have a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, hesitation before I could die. Of course, we are no longer obsessed by color. We are no longer obsessed by race, but color and race play a large part in what if you can't if you don't take that into consideration, you miss a lot of Guadalupe society. So I won't say it, it is the same at the time of uh, Victoire, but it's still very important. Very, very much, very much. And what ultimately for you is, um, as we're wrapping up, is uh, Victor's <coughs> legacy? It seems to me that uh, my mother was telling, forcing me to make a choice between cooking and uh, not cooking. Only uh, intelligent women, uh, only stupid women enjoy cooking. I'm sure, <coughs> I'm convinced that I'm not stupid. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure, I'm convinced that I know how to cook. So I mean, the contradiction between uh, cooking and uh, intelligence, it seems to me, I saw that. All right, Mr. So just as uh, in, the, in the first reading, you are you are told by this sort of vision of her. You're walk, you're going all around the world when the inner journey. So do you feel like this um, this was this inner journey was worthwhile? Uh, yes, but I enjoy uh, traveling. Mm -hmm. So you see, all, I cannot uh, give you an answer which is going to be we uh, invoke. As a same friend. I shall say yes and yes. We oui et no. So I mean yes, I believe that the, the inner journey was very interesting, maybe the most important, but traveling, going to different places, meeting different people, taking from them is important. So both journeys are important. Um, before, do you, where are you? I just read the oui. passage. Okay, before Richard, how do you like the translation? How does that work? <laughs> 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 I have a very good translation. I have said, we call ourselves intimate enemies. He does his job, I do mine. <laughs> What I am claiming is the legacy of this woman who apparently did not leave any. I want to establish the link between her creativity and mine to switch from the savours, the colours and the smells of meat and vegetables to those of words. Victoire did not have a name for her dishes and that didn't seem to bother her. Most of her days she spent locked up in the temple of her kitchen, a small shack behind the house slid slightly back from the wash house. Not saying a word, head bent, absorbed over her kitchen range like a writer hunched over her computer, she would let nobody chop a chive or press a lemon, as if in the kitchen no task was humble enough when aiming at perfection. She frequently tasted the food, but once the composition was completed, she never touched it again. Um, 
before we uh, we take audience questions, I had written a question down that I was then afraid to ask, but I said I could ask it. No, I, mean, <laughs> I don't know why I can't be planning. It. Uh, <laughs> um, well, one of one of the uh, thing, one of the themes throughout the book is um, is lost and and lost and this de this idea of trying to define this loss. And one of the characters says, "What is death?" And the answer is, "Yesterday she kissed. This, she kissed me. Today she's gone." And morbid, macabre person that I am, I wanted to ask Marie what death is to her. Oh. You know, uh, but she said, "Angry." Mm -hmm. I cannot tell you because you know I was uh, young when my mother died. So it seemed to me that when you have a loss like this your whole life is going to be changed. Your whole attitude toward death. So I mean, you have to accept it, but in the same time, you hate it so much, you suffer from it so much, and after all, you have to live with that wound in you. So death is part of life, I live with it. And part of, I think even writing, Memo, like right, my have the memo I wrote, uh, which had to do with death too. I think you feel part of the writing it is also acknowledging that one day you won't be here to tell this, these stories, and the void, and, and when you have to recreate people who are no longer there, you kind of want to make sure that your these voids that you're filling with the people for you, you're filling it for others who might be curious to at the same time. This is what I, I felt. I mean, one day your fox is going to be gone. Mm -hmm. But I mean, let us not be sad and finish uh, this evening with a very That's why I Yes, it's maybe someone has a, a happy question. Very happy question. When are you going to cook next so I can come? I shall uh, invite you on one or two days okay. before we go back to math. Why both of you are wearing black? I'm wondering, uh. did somebody die? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I don't know, it's the, it's the New York writers. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. Yes. Uh, you had mentioned, uh, when Lily Cut asked the question, did you find yourself? I know you've asked, you've answered the question several different times. You said, you know, you had to find out, you had to find who your mother was by understanding uh, her relationship with her mother, with your grandmother. And then that helped you understand who you are. You can tell us exactly who that was. I'm not telling you. Because <laughs> it, it will take about uh, two days and a week, maybe. But you know, I know, uh, for example, I am I accept to be different from the image, uh, a set image of uh, a Guadeloupean person. I discovered that what matters is your personal history, your personal experience, and that the collective identity has nothing to do with it. You see, it's a, it's a lie. So I was very happy at the beginning to be different from the other pen and not to be loved by them. And after that, I understood that after all, you have to be what you are and uh, live with your difference. Am I might clear? Oh, very clear. Well, <laughs> good. Thank you very much for a wonderful conversation and for both of your wonderful body of, of literature. I'm actually interested to find out how you link Victoire to your other female protagonists, um, me and the other stories that you've written, if you see them as having sharing certain certain connections and what those might be. No, the former writer, uh, each book has to be different. So uh, it seems to me that the uh, writing of Victoire had nothing to do, for example, with the writing 
about Sidani, which is the main character from the Zogo. No, writing to be an novelist is to try to tell a different story each time. Of course, you don't succeed because you have uh, always the same uh, obsession, the same fears, the same uh, desires, but they know that you are trying to be, to make them, put them in a different shape. Let's put it this way. So uh, I don't really talk to any of the characters, not at all. Thank you very much for this conversation. Um, I went four days ago, Thursday last, to the New York Historical Society, where Skip Gates gave a talk um, about his new series, about his uh, process he's discovered of and he traced her roots back to Africa. And he started the presentation with a photograph of a woman who's his grandmother, light-skinned woman, and said that this was the, the impetus for him starting this whole project, trying to figure out who he was. And so I'm just wondering if you could make a comment, given what you said about kind of blend of truth and fiction, and this process that he's proposing, which is about upending fictions and finding the real truth, what you make of that kind of genealogical journey, and, and if you have that opportunity, if you want to do that as well, finding the real truth. Yeah, but I mean, I'm not interested in a genealogy per se. I don't give a damn about the who my ancestors were, where they were, what they were doing, where they were living and so on. I don't care. But Victoire and my mother had a special meaning for me in my life and in my understanding. So I, I wrote about them. But too far now, whether my grand, great grandfather was a soldier, uh, no, I don't care. Mm -hmm. So that type of uh, research, that type of genealogy, bores me to death. <laughs> Something at all real about that. Um, yeah, thank you. So follow up on the question that's right for me. Um, just because with Skip Gates and he used, him using the photography, he uses it, I'm assuming, kind of a, as evidence of someone who once existed. But in the first piece that we just read, you have a particular use of photography that doesn't really use, like, this seems to evidence Victoire, but more so animates a light bulb, if you know what I'm trying to say? I guess I want to know how, okay, how do, how do you use photography in your narrative? that goes against just like it being evidence of someone that exists. Yeah, but you know, I, I'm using photograph because uh, I never knew the person. I didn't know Victoire. I didn't know my brother Jean. And so I had only one image of them, photographs. And I was telling a friend uh, not too so long ago that something terrible happened to me some years ago. My son, Denis, in an airport in Dakar, he lose, he lose, he lose, he lose my, all my photographic album. So now, now I have no, not one image of the past, of my mother, father, brother, sisters, myself, when we were young and uh, children. So I mean, uh, I have to <coughs> try to reconstruct uh, who they were and how they were. So for me, uh, a picture or photograph was a way of helping my mother. When I don't have it, I resort to my, to my souvenir and I do what I can about that. I have a question because that follows up on some of this because it seems as if we're in a moment where readers have a hunger for memoirs and the dis to the point where if something is marketed as a memoir and people feel it's not true as in James Fry, they, they even brought a class action suit against the publisher uh, because it was marketed as true and it wasn't. So I'm, I'm thinking about the term they see doesn't really fall into those older categories. Those, that's how you conceive this. And it seemed to me it's between 
a memoir, and a novel. That was the true term for the genre. Um, but that, because it's a very fraught moment where people, in a sense, almost want to possess property of a memoir. I am very happy that uh, my publisher, Isabelle Ganimard, decided to call that a novel because I was going to maybe to be fit with a legal soup <laughs> <laughs> because I was inventing, imagining so much about that. But in a way, it seems to me that uh, even memories, even when you talk about memories, you talk about something which is not true, which is reworked by one individual person. So I mean, it seems to me that people, the fact that people are uh, hungry for memories is very uh, silly. They have to read a, a book and say the book is a memoir. I don't see why they want the fact to be true. What is the difference? What does it add to a story? To know that it is based on a series of facts. Tell me, because I don't see myself, what is importance? Well, I, I think some of it is when a memoir is redemptive or it's about recovery, then they feel it's somehow going to guide them towards, it doesn't necessarily have to be that ABC, a 12-step plan, but it, it often gives people a sense of hope, and so they feel that the story isn't true. They're being somehow manipulated or betrayed. And that's only one explanation, but I think it's a much more complicated question, really. Yeah. OK. There's Give a disclaimer in the book, which says, uh, this book is largely a work of fiction. Isabelle, Isabelle Gallimard, who in that book. No, that was you. This book is largely a work of fiction. Names, characters, places, and incidents are transpositions of the life of the author's mother and grandmother. Yeah, I suppose. I was forced to write that <laughs> <laughs> because uh, they were, we were afraid of uh, pursuing the other. But uh, if we had said memory, and you know what happened to it, because uh, let me tell you, I was very naive before. I wrote a book about uh, my childhood, Le Coeur à Rire et à Pleurer. And in one of the chapters, I took the story, true, uh, extremely true, of my mother taking me to a, a relative who was going to be delivered. She was in the process of being delivered. And so my mother helped her to be delivered. Okay. But unfortunately for me, I said the house uh, was dirty, the, the furniture was bad, and it was a place was not at all attractive. So I say that because uh, for me it was true. And the son of the woman <laughs> who was husband sent me a lawyer, and, the lo and she told me, How dare you say that the, my mother's house was dirty? And I had to pay about uh, seven thousand seven hundred francs. So let's say equivalent of uh, a lot of euros. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm very careful, and I do accept uh, the idea of Yves uh, Gadima to be protected from the reader because people have only one idea in mind, it seems to me, to be nasty with the writer. <laughs> you never hear a nice woman, you never hear a nice uh, approval, always nasty and digging and thinking. So I'm trying to protect myself on <laughs> very <laughs> um, On the point of I guess imagining, as you said, um, your mother and your mother's mother as sexual agents. Um, as what? Or as sexual beings, like their sexuality. Um, 
I was curious as to how important you felt it was to place that in the book um, because it was imagined. Um, so I was ah, because it seems to me that the sex is a very important part of your life and therefore of any writing. Can you imagine a novel without sex? Uh, a bit of uh, at least uh, allusion to sexuality. So I mean, could I write about two living creatures, two women, uh, although I don't, I didn't know them, could I write about them without ever talking about their sex life? No, impossible. I can't do that. So I had, as I didn't know for sure, I had to invent, I had to fabricate. Because